Hi everyone, welcome back to our ongoing series, HMGM, How to Model a Gold Mill in 27,000 Easy Steps. We're doing a little bit of a diversionary trip today. Uh, the holidays have come and gone, didn't get much model building done, used up the archival build footage, that sort of thing. So let's go back to last fall. As part of our attempt to understand the processes of mining and mining technology, we took a visit to the Argo Gold Mill in Idaho Springs. The Argo Gold Mill operated in the early part of the 20th century, and the Argo Tunnel attached to it was started late in the 19th century and then operated in parallel with the mill in the 20th century. The Argo Tunnel connected all kinds of mines in the Clear Creek and Gilpin counties, revitalizing mining in that part of Colorado. So without further ado, let's go to take the tour and see what we found out. The most prominent feature of the Argo site today is the massive mill complex on the north side of the Clear Creek Valley, centrally located within the town of Idaho Springs. The mill is visible from much of the town and can be clearly seen from the higher stretches of Interstate 70 as the highway passes by the town on the south side of the valley. However, the century-old mill is only the newer half of the Argo story. The tunnel was started in 1893 and completed at just over 4 miles in length in 1910, while mill construction only began two years later in 1912. In 1913, two decades after the tunnel was started, the mill was fully constructed and operational. The tunnel initially operated as its own facility, providing drainage and haulage for the mines it intersected between Idaho Springs and Central City. Ore was collected at a massive bin structure, since removed, from which it was dumped into boxcars on a railroad siding. After the mill opened, the tunnel continued operating another 30 years until 1943, when the perfect storm of a major hydraulic disaster in the tunnel and the U.S. entrance to World War II with a corresponding order to shut down gold mining permanently ended all practical operations of the Argo. Today, the first 200 feet or so of the tunnel, or at it in mining terms, is open for tourism from the portal to a bulkhead door 
which was finished in 2017 as part of the EPA's ongoing mitigation efforts to reduce the acid mine drainage into Clear Creek. Additionally, most of the Argo mill and its major equipment, along with related mining equipment and memorabilia gathered from facilities around Colorado, is preserved at the mill as a combined indoor-outdoor private museum. The facility is open year-round for tours and a gold panning experience, weather permitting. Today, however, we need to begin with the man and the tunnel that started it all. Samuel Newhouse and his vision of a drainage and haulage added that would service a portion of Colorado's richest mining country. Samuel Newhouse was born in New York City probably in 1856 and later became a lawyer in Pennsylvania. In 1879, he moved to Colorado to seek his fortune in the booming mineral industry. As his luck ran better than that of many others who came to the newly founded state, his search netted him both a fortune and a wife, and their business and mining investments were variously split between Leadville and Uray. Newhouse later sold those interests and moved to Denver to become a speculator and promoter before continuing onward to Utah. While in Denver, he picked up an idea for a tunnel that had been floated by two brothers from Maine. Silas A. Nowells and Ralph Nowells had come west for the same reason as Newhouse. There was gold in them Colorado hills and they wanted a shot at it. The Colorado Gold Rush had first centered in the Idaho Springs area starting around 1859 when gold was panned from the present confluence of Chicago Creek and Clear Creek. Even before the streams were exhausted of convenient placer deposits, Prospectors were already noting quartz veins with tantalizing iron sulfides in the nearby hills, an obvious place from which the placer gold must have been eroded. New claims and new mines began to multiply, and some of these uncovered rich loads in the rolling mountains north of the Clear Creek Valley. Several boom towns quickly sprung up. Two of these, which survived the eventual collapse of the mining industry and can still be visited today, were Central City and Blackhawk. One of the mountain peaks just southwest of Central City is an ancient volcano with extensive faults and lava tubes, filled so densely with quartz and associated hydrothermal metal deposits that it became known as Quartz Hill and was a prized target in the so-called richest square mile on Earth. At one point it was covered in hundreds of overlapping claims. A later business venture consolidated most of those claims and then proceeded to hollow out the center into a massive crater known locally as the Glory Hole. With all this going on, it was not lost on the Nowells brothers that Idaho Springs was conveniently around 2,000 feet lower than the surface from which the countless vertical mine structures were being sunk between Idaho Springs and Central City. Both ore and groundwater had to be raised from ever deeper shafts at increasing expense. The depths of these mines were approaching the practical limits of the pumps available at the time. To the Nowells brothers, it seemed obvious that a tunnel from Idaho Springs dug in the hillside toward Central City could economically provide drainage, ventilation, and haulage for all mines intersected along the route. Somehow they, in turn, encountered Newhouse, who was flush with funds to invest. He helped form the Argo Mining, Drainage, Transportation, and Tunnel Company in 1891 using two million of capital, and in 1893, work started on the Newhouse Tunnel. Silas Nowells became the site superintendent for some years, and Ralph Nowells was the lead electrician. The concept was this. Open a new portal below the base of Seton Mountain, facing mostly north and slightly northwest. The tunnel would start just above Clear Creek in Idaho Springs, providing both a drainage route and ready access to the railroad. It would then proceed in a mostly linear fashion and the grade of the adit would be upward from the portal at a rate of about one half of a percent, enabling practical and gentle gravity drainage and permitting ore trains to travel uphill empty and then back downhill when they were full and heavy. In the process, it would traverse from Idaho Springs to Central City, beginning in Clear Creek County and ending well inside Gilpin County. 
The route was designed to crosscut the major ore veins along its path and correspondingly intersect numerous mines. Work in 1893 began with hand digging and black powder charges. In 1894, the first pneumatic tools were brought in and dynamite followed shortly after. Motive force for the early mechanical tools was provided by a massive steam boiler and engine. Today, the engine is long gone, but the boiler was later moved into the mill building and used for other operations, where it still stands now in a state of partial ruin. At one point, the progress of the tunnel reached a rate of one half mile per year, setting a new record for diggings. Initial mucking and ore haulage was performed with manual labor and mules. In the early 1900s, three-phase electric power came to the Idaho Springs area by way of the United Power Company of Georgetown, a few miles up the valley. At this point, the Argo Tunnel was more than 12,000 feet into the mountain and animal haulage was becoming impractical. So, the company quickly built a new powerhouse to operate a 500-volt electrical tram system along with a 50 kilowatt generator to run power for the critical tunnel services such as light and ventilation. Thereafter, the mules were retired and Goodman brand electric locomotives continued to both extend the tunnel and haul ore from the increasing number of mines that now had access to the Argo's workings. The ore was transported in three-ton boxcars at an average depth of 1,800 feet below the surface. The Goodman Equipment Corporation, based in Chicago, Illinois, continued to supply electric college equipment to mining industries around the world under its own manufacture until 2003, when it was acquired by Bateman Trident of South Africa. The Argo would have been one of its earliest customers. A three-ton boxcar was about 52 cubic feet by volume. Some of these cars, or units very similar, are still on display out front of the Mill Museum. The Goodman locomotives used after the initial electrification were later upgraded to 7-ton Westinghouse locomotives capable of pulling ore trains that range from 20 to 45 boxcars in length. These continued to use the Argo Tunnel's 500-volt DC system, which was also tapped to power hoists and ventilation fans at some of the connected mines. By 1906, more than 16,000 feet of tunnel had been constructed including about 11,000 feet with clearances of 10 foot by 10 foot to accommodate two separate rail lines running in parallel. The remainder continued at 5 foot width by 8 foot height with a single rail. Sources vary on the tunnel's in the clear dimensions for the initial two track section as well as depth. Some say it was initially 8 foot square, others claim it was 10 foot square. We suspect that it may have been designed at a target width of 10 by 10 and was validated in a later survey as having a true minimum clearance of 8 feet square after timbering, infrastructure, and other services were installed. Of course, this is just an assumption. Additionally, some sources claim the wider section ended at around 11,000 feet from the portal. However, 13,100 feet, or just about 2.5 miles, seems to be the more accurate number. Some confusion may have come from ongoing revisions in the design as the excavation progressed deeper into the rocks of the Idaho Springs Formation. The ultimate distance, which took 17 years to complete with several stops and restarts in between, was 4.16 miles at a net cost of somewhere between 5 million and 10 million US dollars. As a side note, that would be closer to 150 million today.
A general fact sheet for the Argo or Newhouse Tunnel is as follows. The final distance was 21,968 feet or 4.16 miles. At 8 foot by 8 foot in the clear with two rail sets, it progressed a total of 13,100 feet back into the mountains, or 2.48 miles, completed before 1906. At 8 foot by 5 foot, the remaining section had one rail set for 8,868 feet, or 1.68 additional miles, and was completed by 1910. That represented the furthest extent of the tunnel into the mountains. Services provided by the Argo included Haulage the tunnel would remove both ore and waste rock, for a fee, from participating mines. Electricity. The tunnel had a 500 volt DC system for the tram, which was also tapped for hoist and ventilation use. Air. The Argo would provide compressed air from a 1,000 cubic foot per minute Ingersoll Rand electric compressor backed by a 150 horsepower motor located not far from the portal. So unfortunately not for us, it's still here today. This thing also has original heavyweight oil sitting inside here from the last in operation. The compressor was very nearly scrapped for World War II material recovery, but fortunately there was no way to get it off the mountainside and that effort was abandoned. Ventilation. Ventilation was provided for the tunnel itself, but the tunnel would also provide natural ventilation for any mines connected since they would have an entrance at the top of the shaft as well as an interest at the portal of the Argo at it. Drainage. Drainage through the Argo was provided by a channel in the floor. It was 12 inches in depth, sources agree. However, sources again vary on whether the width was 18 inches or 24 inches. Maintenance. The Argo, back at its portal, had buildings that provided blacksmith and machine shop services, which would offer anything the mines needed that they could not provide themselves. Destinations. Ore was transferred to the Colorado and Southern Railroad for external transport to other smelters. Later, when the Argo Mill was built, from 1913 to 1943, a second option was to sell the ore to the Argo for local processing. The beauty of this arrangement is that high-grade ores could be sent directly to smelters farther out, such as in Denver, but low-grade ores that would otherwise not be economical to mine and ship could instead be processed locally. Early on, the Argo Tunnel's owners did encounter an interesting problem. Given that a mine, once intersected, could not have its drainage easily stopped, the incentive for the mine owner was to take advantage of free drainage and then continue hauling ore vertically at a now reduced cost. However, the advantages of hauling ore out of the Argo soon overcame any early quibbling, and in 1913 alone the tunnel moved 30,000 tons of ore billing the mine owners on a price schedule that was based on the distance between the participating mine and the portal at Idaho Springs. These kinds of ore volumes were sufficient to justify the massive investment in the newly completed Argo Mill. For comparison, the town of Blackhawk near to Central City, but not having a massive haulage tunnel under its mines, moved around 45,000 tons to the railroad that same year. The impact of the tunnel was so significant that the state of Colorado's Bureau of Mines in its 1913 to 1914 annual report noted the following, quote, A healthy revival in mining is shown at all the outlying districts of Gilpin County. The old mines were worked from the surface through shafts and produced many millions of dollars of gold, but as depth was gained, the flow of water was so excessive that the profits were reduced and the owners were at last compelled to stop operations altogether. The Newhouse Tunnel has solved this problem, as evidenced by the new and extensive work now done on such famous mines as the Gunnel, Concrete, Dyke, and the Kansas Borough Groups, all of which are now worked through the Newhouse Tunnel and are disclosing larger and richer bodies of ore at a depth of 1,800 to 2,000 feet." Unquote. Nearly 50 years after the first pickaxe struck the side of Seton Mountain, the end of the Argo was defined by a catastrophic accident. It occurred at end of shift on January 19, 1943, as a crew of four lessee miners were preparing to blast an existing stope in the Kansas Mine Group. The stope was accessed near the Argo's 19,000-foot mark by first exiting 2,200 feet into a crosscut and then traveling upward another 300 feet or so through raises. 
This would have put the miners about 1,400 to 1,500 feet below the surface, a bit northwest of Quartz Hill. The operation was an ordinary day's work for subgrade hard rock mining. Set and shoot the charges near the end of the day, wait around long enough to verify a successful firing, then leave and let the dust and toxic gases from the explosives clear overnight. In the morning, they would return to scale and muck the loose material. The Kansas mine was flooded behind the stoke and the intent was to leave about 20 feet of wall thickness between the Argo facing stoke and the older workings beyond, which could then be drilled through to initiate drainage. The operation was doomed by miscalculations. Old workings throughout the Nevadaville area were actually flooded as high as the 1200 foot mark and the water pressure behind the wall, later estimated as high as 500 PSI, likely exceeded anything the miners expected to find. Worse, they misunderstood either the thickness of the wall or the size of the charges they were setting and were about to demo it down to only about 10 feet thickness instead of the intended 20. After setting fuses and making their way back to the Argo level, they waited for confirmation of the blast. They never clocked out of that shift. Seconds after the charges detonated, a massive slug of water broke through the critically weakened stope and sent a debris-laden flash flood down through the workings and crosscut toward the Argo tunnel. The four men waiting below were killed instantly when the flood reached them. Near the portal entrance, a motorman named Bill Bennett was towing out an ore train. He heard a distant roar just as the lights went out and ran toward the portal even as water began to arise around his feet. He had gotten safely clear of the portal and about as far as the compressor house when the five-foot wall of water arrived, washing out his ore train. Water then continued to rise in the tunnel faster than it could drain out, filling it to the roof and turning into a violent spray that shot partway across the Clear Creek Valley and took several hours to subside. Afterward, the tunnel was a mess of mud, rocks, and wrecked infrastructure. The debris was excavated and the four bodies were recovered. The Argo, however, was finished. At the time of the accident, the United States had been officially involved in World War II for just over a year. In October of 1942, the U.S. government's War Resources Board had issued Order L-208, which shut down nearly all gold mining in the U.S. Revenues for the Argo, already declining since the First World War, now fell critically short. The cost of the damage suffered in the accident was enormous, and multiple lawsuits were filed afterwards. Together, these factors permanently ended all operations of both tunnel and mill. The tunnel, however, continued to drain groundwater from the mines. In the 1970s, two things happened that affected the future of the Argo. The first was that investors, interested in preserving an example of Colorado's mining history, were organized by J.N. Maxwell and they purchased the Argo property in February 1976. The second was that the United States was gaining a new awareness of how legacy industrial pollution was affecting quality of life in the present. Acid mine drainage from the Argo was a major and ongoing source of dissolved metals pollution in Clear Creek. At the time, there were no fish in Clear Creek for many miles, and worse, further downstream, the polluted river was a primary water source for gold in Colorado. To underscore the point, in the spring of 1980, a suspected collapse somewhere in the tunnel led to a temporary damming of water inside the Argo, followed by a breakthrough surge that turned Clear Creek from clear to orange for several miles. Although archival photos of that event are not easily located, in 2015, an accidental release of wastewater from the Gold King mine by an EPA contractor caused similar pollution in the Animas River and a resulting orange color. The color is the result of acidic drainage becoming supersaturated when it encounters other cleaner water sources and the pH then rises. The iron oxide, as a result, precipitates out of solution. Although the iron oxides are troublesome enough, 
The telltale color of acid drainage, sometimes known as yellow boy near long-term mine drainage sites, almost always means that other pollutants, such as arsenic, lead, copper, and manganese, are also along for the ride. By the late 1990s, the EPA had built and started up a large wastewater treatment plant near the Argo, not far below the portal, in roughly the location where the Argo's railroad siding and ore bins had once stood. Metal sludge is removed from the outflow of the Argo as well as nearby Virginia Canyon and the Big Five Tunnel, processed using chemicals and settling, and then shipped off to landfill. In recent years, a new bulkhead was installed about 200 feet back from the portal. Water behind the bulkhead is kept at a constant level of about 5 to 6 feet, providing stabilizing pressure on the bulkhead and ensuring that seasonal variations, or another internal collapse like the 1980 event, cannot send a surge that would overwhelm the treatment facility. Although this does mean that most of the tunnel's once incredible four-mile length is permanently closed and ruined beyond use, in 2017, the front section was finally reopened to the public. Visitors to the Argo Museum can now get a brief taste of what it was like to enter into the depths of the mountain in search of the wealth locked up in Colorado's mineral belt. That's pretty much the end of today's episode, but, you know, really sobering thought thinking of those four miners who lost their life in that tunnel. They went in there just thinking it was going to be another day's work, and then, just like that, they lost their lives and went to their eternal reward. So, it's been a couple episodes since we've looked at a Bible verse. This is Jesus speaking. It says, he calling the crowd to him with his disciples. He said, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whosoever loses his life for my sake and the gospel's will save it. Here's the key verse. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world, all the gold in the world, let's say, and lose his own soul? What can a man give in return for his soul? Your life on earth comes to an end. Your soul is far more valuable, and no amount of gold can buy that. Keep that in mind for later episodes. We hope to see you next time when we move on from the Argo Tunnel to actually looking at the Argo Mill and all of the process technology that took place in there. Can't wait for it. See you then. Has anyone seen my phone?